have an amazing guest with me here today. Goes by the name of Matt Sedillo. How you doing today? Uh, how you doing, Thomas? Thank you for having me. Yeah, definitely. Glad, glad to be here. Would you be willing to share one of your poems with us? Yeah, this one's called uh, this one's called Arena, and uh, you know it uh, like myself, like this hat, um, <laughs> like many other things, is from Los Angeles, California, and uh, you know it, it's inspired by my mother, my sister, my fiance, and and so many powerful, powerful women I've known in my life. That's awesome. All right, let's do it. Los Angeles full of abuelas raise grandkids in Spanglish under the watchful eye with them with the Virgin of Jesus. Make a village out of a duplex raised Catholic, but the roots are indigenous. Several generations of family extension all growing in one plot. Hand-me-downs and shared rules, rooms, and reflections. En la quech porque mi casa es tu casa and he promises that's family living. That's plaura. Let's light a candle. Burn some sage, pick your saints, and set your altar to the sign of the cross. The sound of the conscient prayers lifts the four directions as culture. Not contradiction. Folks in the back, they fight for a living. Fight 15 hail from the rowdy section of Dodger Stadium, but the hearts still burn with the fire in that Chavez ravine. And here is home, Lorena. At 54 cents on the dollar, America's most exploited worker. Neglected. Disrespected. Underrepresented. Presumed incompetent. If she lives life as expected, she would label statistic. If she managed to outpace them, threaten, they will blame affirmative action. But either way, they will not see her. They will demand her labor, paid and unpaid, smiling, her eyes humble and her mouth silent. Lady of the River. Cities past, present and future. The Queen of Angels. Invisible to those who float through canyons, lagoons and cemeteries, whitewashing adobe through a series of fever dreams connected by a bridge called her back. To those who make demands. To the stories told to bury the past, the ones who serve to remind her that she works for them, that she is lucky to even have a job here in a pueblo de Nuestra Señora La Reina de Los Angeles de Rio, por cinco la or as they like to call it, La La Land. In the 1780s, we built the pueblo. In the 1890s, the brickyards of Montebello built one again, only beaten and shot, only for no Mexicans, no dogs, only for a different set of rules, for a different set of schools, only be written out of the history of a city we founded as we are priced out of the homes of our mothers, yet more and more of greater Los Angeles suddenly discovered, and this is the struggle of our forebears, when Papan Historia y tierra hasta la victoria siempre. The struggle is real. La lucha sigue. La reina de los Angeles in the front lines of every fight, holding it down, holding up the better half of the sky, fighting justification, fighting for education, fighting for tenants' rights, fighting la migra y la jura, because fuck the police. Ching la ice, fighting for dignity, hers and ours, all the damn time. Proud and brown and brown and proud are the hearts and hands, the backbone of these race fists. So we throw two fingers up when we say fuck Donald Trump. That's not identity politics. So that is the cry of the proletariat at 54 cents on the dollar. She is the face of it. So when you see her, when you see her pushing some other mother's rollers, lock behind cash, pushing the third, fourth, fifth shift of the oppressed, show some respect, bow your head, and bend the knee. All hail arena, the once and future queen. All right, let's snap it up for that. That was powerful. You know, it's interesting hearing that poem is that you're talking about you know, uh, Luis is the name of the poet, right? Luis Luis, yeah. yeah. That, um, you know, he's one of your, your mentors, yeah. someone that you look up to. But then there's also people, like for, for me, for instance, other people who look up to you like that. It's like, you know, Matt's the poet that I use as a role model, or the way Matt transforms people's lives with his poetry. So it's interesting, too, to kind of see that perspective, that we all, at the different levels we were talking about, have people we look up to and people who look up to us. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. I appreciate you sharing that poem and really speaks to that and I know a lot of people out there resonate with it as well a yeah. yeah. um, couple things that I wanted to just ask you a question on is you talked about yeah. in the beginning um, I think you said a line of something of lowest paid or under most underappreciated worker mm-hmm. or something like that could you talk a little bit about yeah that? well if you look at if you look at the, we talk about the wage gap but then you actually look within the wage gap right you find that the lowest paid worker in America is a Latina mm-hmm. at 54 cents on the dollar it's it's the, the lowest uh, and the most exploited and this actually you know this pretty much reflects um it reflects a lot. I mean, it reflects a lot. I mean, it made, I mean, starting reading those statistics, it made a lot of sense. And and this idea that um, I mean, the people that are most most impacted by by you know the group people that are considered that fall under that rubric of of, of you know Latino, Latina, Latinx. Um, you know, we we generally have this like, kind of idea of a brown person, um, but of course there are there are many shades of that. But you know that that general experience, right? It made a lot of sense, and it doesn't just fade. It's not just a question of undocumented workers. It's not just a question of undocumented labor, although it's most impacted. Um, there's a lawsuit in Silicon Valley with this guy who's suing because 
he found out that he was making less than than all his counterparts, right? Mm-hmm. And he's making like a hundred grand, mm-hmm. and everyone else making a hundred, like a buck fifty. Wow, you know. So like he found out about yeah. this, and he's suing them because of this. So, I mean, it is this kind of like uh, this brown surname like tax, like mm-hmm. you know, like I couldn't help to notice that you know you come from this group of people, I'm going to pay you less. Yeah. But man, it just it just it just happens over and over and over again. And it's not it's not just a question of of undocumented labor. It's just a whole like it's, it's like a brown wage, and and it's low. And um, and I think that really makes sense to to how things are in this country, where it's just seen as like it's seen just seen as just like this like pliable labor. You're seen as just like this like wet cloth that's just gonna just wring, mm. you know, just get the labor out of it. And mm. um, wow, and that's kind of like that's kind of. Um, that goes with my life experience and it does something to you. It does something to you. Cause I mean, my whole family, like, you know, if somebody's unemployed or something like that, though, everyone will like jump on them to be like, go volunteer, go do something. You can't just sit there. You can't just yeah. sit there. So this idea that you can't just sit there, you have to work. I mean, you start internalizing this thing that you are a, a, a vessel of labor, mm. you know? And, um, you know, I have friends from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, um, where they, they you hear that like you know get up and get a job right yeah but it's not as extreme it's not as just like cult like mm-hmm. as, as as it is like in my own personal experience or my own like whatever this this, this, this like work cult yeah that um it's just so common so prevalent um because because of the way things are things are set up the way things are set up is that you, know, you have to work you have to work you have to work you have to work and like um it's just brutal. It's brutal. I mean, it's, it's some brutal stuff. So um, that's where that comes from. That's where that's what I was talking about. And um, you know, if she lives life as expected, she be labeled statistic mm-hmm. as a part. But like you know, but she you know, if she managed to outpace them, threaten, they will blame affirmative action, yeah. right? So that's how that's the flip side of it, right? So like, despite all of these all these setbacks, despite all these things, despite all all this whatever you know, and whatever I say for myself goes doubly for women, yeah. right? Um, you know, like you, I make it in these situations. I make it in these situations. I make it to places I'm not supposed to be. And that's where I experience the most extreme forms of racism. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, why are you here? You mm-hmm. don't belong here. You shouldn't be here. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's the kind of, you know, attitude I end up getting. I mean, I, I've been, a, I've been asked, I remember one time I was being interviewed um, by a school newspaper and they asked me about, you know, what my general, my, what, you know, they were asking me some broad question. I said something about the fact that college degrees aren't what they meant, what they used to be. Yeah. And they were all struggling now, even like you can be so degreed, but you're still going to be struggling. And that's because in, in, for so many various reasons, but one of the chief ones is like automation and how all these jobs are being replaced and, and they can't be staffed. And so you have a lot of people with degrees um, who don't have a place to really work. Yeah. And she said, that, you know, that's really great that we're saying. I think it's true. But, you know, we are interviewing you because you're Latino. If we can get back to the part where you're Latino, wow. that'd be great. Right. So, like, I don't want to, like, listen to your mind or what you have to say about the broad economy that we all live in. Yeah. I want you to get back to talking about rice and beans, right? Mm. That's kind of what she was telling me, right? Yeah. And, um, and she asked, she even in the interview asked me for a Latino experience. Mm. I mean, the whole thing was ridiculous. Yeah. The whole thing was ridiculous. But that's the kind of thing that happens all the time. The, this is the kind of thing that happens all the time. You know, like, you know, like, you're not here to, to be on stage to be the poet. You're here to serve us. You're here to, you know, what, you know, and there's nothing wrong with serving people. There's nothing wrong with being of service. And there's nothing wrong with having these jobs. But the idea that, you know, and there isn't anything wrong with having those jobs. And people shouldn't debase people that have those jobs. Right? That, they, that shouldn't happen anyway. Yeah. No matter what color the person is doing the job, no one should be debased for yeah. that. That No labor should be debased. Yeah. Right? But this idea that that labor is debased and you're designed for it because you're debased. Yeah. Is, is, um, is so much of, so much that goes on in this, in this society. Um, and so that that's kind of what that that poem's about. What, what do you hope people walk away with from that, or what do you hope is the transformation experience they have while listening to it? Well, I mean, like that poem, Lorena, is written for is kind of in a way is designed for the people it's talking about. Mm. You know, so I want people to you know walk away feeling dignified and strong, and not that they didn't have dignified dignity before they heard the poem, but I want people to feel I want people to be charged up. You know, yeah. charges me up reading it, and I want them yeah. to be charged up too. So that was written kind of. The kind of for the community, you know. That's that, awesome. That I'm a part of, so. Um, yeah, it does. It does have that ending where you feel like, you know, like yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And anyone else, I want them to walk away feeling yeah. I want them to feel strong. I want them to feel like you know, you know, uh, love it or hate, thunder dogs on top or something yeah. like that. You know, like you know, I, I want them to have that feeling too. So like, I, I want everyone to have a good feeling coming out of the poem. But I mean, specifically, the the main goal of the poem was um, was you know, it's a poem written in the era of Trump. It's a poem written in the era of like. A very explicit attack, a very explicit thing coming at you. So I wanted to make sure that I wrote a poem that was 
you know. That was fuck Trump, but here's why. <laughs> <laughs> I am joined by the amazing, the brilliant Shelby Birch. How are you, Shelby? I am amazing and wonderful <laughs> and lit. Thank you for having me. Okay, you've been, you know, building it up. We'd love to hear a poem. Would you mind sharing one with us? I would love to share one with you. And um, the poem that I'm going to do, I feel is, uh, every time I do this poem, I just get so excited. Like I feel like an adrenaline rush. Mm. Um, it is called Backbone. And um, I wrote this um, my freshman year of college and I still perform it and still get excited. So uh, this poem is, is Backbone. <clears throat> We women are the backbone of the world. And mom ain't raise no fools. It's time to receive the credit where credit is due and it's been past notice. For we've been past and gone unnoticed for the burdens we bury on our backs. And the bruises bestowed in our bones. We've been holding y'all up by holding it down. For we are the uncrowned queens of the universe. Jay-Z and Kanye need to watch our thrones and bow down to our breasts. Bless our feet as we carry the world in the depths of our wounds. We've been cooking the nation in the pots of our belly and humanity has never tasted so good. You see, now is the time to take back our titles and restore our queendoms. Girl, power is an understatement where we break the bonds to misogynistic freedom. We are the ladies who sing the blues. The eyes who are watching God, the figurative language in your poetry. We hold the power of a population in our ovaries. We brought breath to the lungs, stood by our men, even if that meant at times standing by ourselves. We put the suffer in suffrage and then turned into a movement. Now ask any man to make change in a pencil skirt, stilettos, and see if he can do it. I think not. We are the Coretta Scots who are still looking for our kings to bring us up another notch. We women have already claimed our spots in history. And history may not claim us back. And maybe we have some bones to pick, but when you're too busy being a backbone to the weak and spineless, getting recognition seems to be irrelevant, but it's time to reinvent the concept of a woman. Redefine the perimeters mankind has boxed us in, for we've been thinking outside the crate on the box for far too long, see, coming in the detail with female, we've paid our dues. We walk that walk and talk that talk, we sure look good doing both. Examine our skeletons and see that our bones are made from steel to show that we are not easily broken. That we bend our backs to put food on the table Or bend our backs to tables if there was none to begin with That when we are losing in war We pull a piece of vertebrae from our spine And put it in the barrel of a gun as ammunition That we use our backbones as crosses And place Jesus in there To know that he still lives within us We put meaning back into sacrifice We put sacrifice back into perspective And waking up every day may be tough Knowing that the world is already against us But alas, a man might be the head, but a woman will always be the neck. I said a man might be the head, but a woman will always be the neck to hold you up and to hold you down. We might be living in a man's world, but it ain't nothing without a woman. We got one heck of a job. We are the backbones of planet Earth. Now we deserve credit where credit's due. Y'all should all know a woman's true worth. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> wow i had shivers that was mad powerful thank you thank you oh, i'm like every time I, I do a piece like i just get so exhausted because uh like i exert so much energy but it's like great adrenaline like at the same time so yeah thank you thank you for that oh thank you it, it seemed like when right before you performed like you went somewhere before you performed is, my, is there truth in that oh 100 percent um when I was um, being mentored uh, through um, Blue Bailey, she taught me before I ever open my mouth, before I perform, I need to set my stage. Mm. I need to get in the zone. So setting my stage means that I'm preparing myself. I'm eliminating all distractions. I'm clearing my head and I'm going back to the place um, where I wrote the poem and why I wrote the poem and the purpose behind the poem. So I took a second to get my thoughts together and to channel uh, that poem, channel the backbone, channel the woman who wrote that poem and the woman that I am. So yeah, you got to set your stage before you can perform. <laughs> what, so what were you saying? You channeled what, why you wrote it, where it came from. 
where did like the first sentence, tell me about where were you when that first sentence got written? And did you do it with a pen and a pencil? Did you type it? Did you do it in your mind? Oh man, it was, was, this poem was written about four years ago. Um, I think I, I wrote it in my dorm. I, I, I don't know. Like I actually cut that poem and um, originally it started with the definition of a backbone, but I didn't really think that as I was performing it through the years, I didn't think that um, it added to the piece. And I was just like, hold up. Why am I giving a definition of a backbone? Let me just start with this line. We women are the backbone of the world. Like that's, that's powerful in itself. So um, I was definitely in college and I was writing it for an event, um, but that's where um, I was. And I guess it just took um, life and form on its own. Mm, that's amazing. What, what's the reactions like when you perform it? Oh man. Like this is kind of one of the poems that, I am known for. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> like when people um, hear about my work or, you know, think of a poem um, to stick to me, like it's definitely backbone. Uh, yeah. I, 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 similar to what you said, you said that you got chills. Uh, people have said that um, people, Oh, I have to tell the story. So I participated in the women's March in Washington, DC and you know, what better place to do a poem um, like that at that event. So we were just in the middle of, of the street and I just did a poem. <laughs> I, I did that poem and there was a little girl, um, she, it was her birthday and she was turning 13 years old. And as I finished the poem, like I, I had a crowd around me, but when I finished, her mother came up to me and said, can, can my daughter get a picture with you? I was like, of course, sure. She said, your poem inspired my daughter and she told me that you made her birthday oh wow and I, was, I was like wait, <laughs> like, wait what like i you know I, I don't do this poetry just just i just for like my own entertainment like that that's the whole point but it just takes me aback like every single time you know that some random stranger especially um a 13 year old girl that i'd never met before she felt that inspired um you know to, to take a picture with me and say that i made her birthday um so that is the effect that that poem has and a lot of poet poets will um retire a piece after a while because they get tired of reciting it or they feel that they they've outgrown it and i'm still performing that poem Four years later, there's no outgrowing um, the confidence um, of being a woman, honestly. So, uh, yeah, that, that's usually the reaction that I get from that poem. Did, did you say there's no outgrowing the confidence of being a woman? No, there, I, I don't feel like you is, can is that what, the of, of, of that poem has to be one of the most mm. electrifying uh poems that I have as far as like when I feel it, like I can actually feel myself getting bigger mm. when I do that poem. So I don't think anytime soon that I will um, stop performing that because it gives me a feeling and it still touches others. So that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I have an amazing guest. High five. Hey. Boom. She goes by the name of Danya Al Huli. Do you think we could hear one last poem? Absolutely. All right. What's, what's, what's this one called? This one's called Wrapped Around a Finger. Do you want to give any context or are we jumping in? Yeah, it's actually surprisingly about my wedding ring. Mm -hmm. um, it was a very unique story, um, just kind of a summary. It was just interesting that um, I'm, not a, I'm not big on wedding rings being mm -hmm. like super cliche and fancy and the diamond and things like that. So I was very, I was like basic, you know, do whatever you want, get like a band or whatnot. But it was this constant like push, like no, it was a demand in a very stressful process of like, no, you have to do this research. You have to go find it. You have mm -hmm. to pick it. You have to. And so after I had gone through all those hoops and loops to find the ring that was appealing enough to purchase, he ended up buying a completely different oh one. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and it sounds very materialistic, it but doesn't. I think for me, it was like, you put me through this circus and then you disrespected the choice I, mm -hmm. I accepted. And then the ring didn't fit. And mm -hmm. we got it sized like three times and it still wouldn't fit. And I was like, that's God telling you, like, it's <laughs> not fitting. <laughs> this doesn't fit. <sighs> and so, um, yeah. So that that's what this poem is about. It just It's a metaphorical representation of how this ring, just everything wasn't a fit. And even though it was loose, 
I was in a suffocating relationship, and so it was like that give and take of it. Mm. All right, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. It was loose. Ironically, the only element of us that wasn't constricting me, but I hated it. I hated that oversized, unfitting stone wrapped around my finger almost as much as I hated you. I just didn't know it yet. I didn't know I was being suffocated until I finally escaped from your grasp, inhaled my first breath in 10,968 hours, recognized that the metaphorical bruises around my soul were not the marks of love you claimed them to be. It was then that I felt the weight of being both lonely and alone. Once upon a time, I loved the latter. Now it haunts me like a ghost, echoing its moans across the empty hallways you carved within me. Curse my heart's ability to expand in love like a mother's womb, making space for another soul to thrive. I let you in and couldn't see that I was the one dying to keep you alive. Though that dead weight around my finger and around my soul have been lifted off me, I remain in a state of remission, learning what it means to stay lonely and alone. Snap it up. What What was the line? Um, the only it was the only thing not constricting, or it's right at the beginning. Yeah. Um, so the poem starts. It was loose. Ironically, the only element of us that wasn't constricting mm, me. Such good poetry. Because everything else, <laughs> I think the word suffocating was a, an adjective mm. I used frequently in the relationship. And I was constantly told by not only him, but, you know, society of like, that's normal. Anxiety and cold feet is normal. And I think to some level, like the apprehension is normal. But then when it becomes like you feel like you can't breathe, Mm -hmm. there's an issue. Yes. You need to get out. Agreed. But when you're young and you've never been in that level of commitment before, it's always been short term or kind of you don't you have nothing to compare it to. Mm-hmm. And you take everyone's advice who's already married or engaged and they tell you that's normal. You think, all right, I'm the problem. I'm going to go mm-hmm. through this. I'm going to try. I'm going to keep fighting it. But, you know, eventually the truth comes out and you recognize. And so I hope more people, you know, recognize their intuition and what it's saying. How has your relationship with your inner voice and trusting yourself evolved or changed? In two polar opposites, sometimes I feel like, um, I mean, I, I, I was reminded to definitely never ignore it again. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also feel like now I'm at a phase of, am I just being triggered? Mm-hmm. And is this a trigger? Is this anxiety? Because I feel like, so I'm you know currently talking to someone and it's like every time something happens, I'm like, I flash back and think, is he going to react the same way? Should I not do this? And mm-hmm. then it just causes all this unnecessary stress. And I'm like, I need to not listen to those maybe inner voices and just kind of follow my heart mm-hmm. and the intuition of it. Mm-hmm. So it's it's been um, not a struggle. It's just been an adventure to kind of navigate between which voices are the ones I want to follow. Yeah, it's powerful. Appreciate yeah. you sharing that. Thank you. Today, I'm super excited. I have an amazing guest who not only is one of my favorite poets, but she's also from my hometown of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. She goes by the name of Destiny Fletcher. How's it going, Destiny? So far, so good. Would you mind sharing another poem with us? Oh, absolutely. Um, let me see. Because I was like trying to like think of the ones that I have that are memorized already. I can do that one. Okay. Um, so this is like the opposite. <laughs> Of the poem that I, uh, that I um, recently did, but um, this poem was actually, I wrote this back in 2013, um, still, still relevant to this day, um, but definitely something um, that I still, I still enjoy. Um, so this poem is called um, Black Woman with Strawberry Dreams. Tell me a bedtime story. Like as if there are happy endings and princes who wear shields and fought dragons to be here with me. Or when nights get lost in our business hours, at least kiss my forehead and hold me tightly sometimes. I am losing faith in how love can be healing. It's done so much damage that my heart Contains broken shards that still bleed after construction. It's like being told that God loved you a second ago. 
Like men were overpowered with so much pride that they forgot why they crowned you. Tell me a bedtime story. Because this is as close as I am going to get to love. It remains a fairy tale now. Happy endings, swords and shields. I protect myself sometimes. Wasted war cries on makeup remedies. Eyeshadow, lipstick. I am at war with my own beauty, wondering if there was a gateway to men like you because it only seemed like peasants come knocking. I don't mean to be full of myself. But black women seem to always get the good guys at the end of Tyler Perry movies. I want to know if it's true. I want to stop dreaming. I forgot what being a woman felt like. Built massacres and the righteous of dawn and the crepes of my eyelids broke mirrors to the sounds of you're not pretty enough, you're not strong enough. I grow impatient, standing at this line to sit at my own throne, dreaming for what? I don't need a king to crown me royal. Hell, I don't need a carriage. Because God has already poured ink in my pond and soaked me to perfection. My God, I'm beautiful, gorgeous. Mel Duce for ser linda, queen. I have been dreaming. For what? For sweeter things. And if a man can handle my wrath and my kindness, for someone to follow suit and become mine, I've spent so much time trying to get out of my own mind, how can you win a battle that you should have lost years ago? Do you leave footprints in your closet when you walk out of it? Does your kingdom proclaim a false king to make it civilized again? You are not worthy of my heart. Don't tell me that love still exists when it holds more lost numbers than wins. I am sick and tired of being a loser to this game, to this false prophecy. I have been dreaming for what? I have admit that I am afraid, afraid that one day my dreams will finally kill me because all I have been doing is looking for something sweeter, dreaming after bedtime stories. Thank you. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> that seemed to be a, a vulnerable poem. It is <laughs> very, very much. Um, it's it's kind of like jumping back into like, you know, how do I look at myself um, versus back when I had I was going through so much um, with love and with understanding what love is, and also like with my depression. Like mm -hmm. you know, um, when you experience depression and you haven't gone to talk to people about it and um, it was just one of those poems that I wrote and I was like, I need, I need this outlet. I need someone to hear this because I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk to anyone about it, but at least it's, it's a, it's written in a poem for people to understand it. Mm. So it, it's definitely, definitely something vulnerable. <laughs> is, is that one of the poems where you have young girls coming up and talking to you about afterwards? Yes. A lot of young girls talk to me about it, um, especially with, you know, again, the, the, the high school love is happening, it's flourishing. And, you know, and then when, when those, you know, high school loves tend to fade away, it's like, what are you left with? Mm. You know, what do you, um, you know, is there still a hope? And a lot of times with us, you know, we, we know that there's a hope. But for high school, you know, you 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 know what that high school sweetheart feeling is. You know mm. what that love is. And then you also know what that heartbreak is. Mm. So, you know, you can't tell them that, Oh, it's, 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 um, it's, it's not a, a, a good feeling. Oh, it's not a bad feeling. Um, just to let them know that there's still hope that you still are dealing with these demons after you've accepted yourself, that they don't just go away. Um, you're constantly dealing with those on the daily. Mm. We got ourselves a guest. Hello. He goes by the name of Super B. Yep. In my phone book, it looks like superb. Yeah. Is that done on purpose? On purpose. <laughs> uh, double meaning. Yeah. 
Would you mind sharing another poem with us? Let's do it. Which poem are you going to do? This one is called the uh, Red String Poem. And yes, enjoy. Enjoy. Here we go. So the other day I met this guy at Starbucks. The green in his eyes reminded me of these emeralds I saw and this girl's loud earrings I met in Philadelphia on a bumpy plane ride back to Cali and the wrinkles in her hands. They reminded me of the loose skin on my grandma's bum Filipino knees and every time her shaky hands would grip her walker, it would remind me of everything broken but still willing to try, like, like my parents' relationship. And my parents, they remind me of me for obvious reasons, like I have my mother's teeth and my dad's bad jokes, but more because I'm convinced I was supposed to meet those two people in my lifetime and God just made it like super easy, right? See, in Chinese myth, the gods tied red strings around our ankles, connecting us to all the people in this life we were destined to meet. Though sometimes these strings tangle, they never break. Maybe every time I use the phrase, well, I thought I was falling in love was us really just tripping over someone else's string. Or every time I say I'm too busy, I'm all tied up. Maybe it's because we were all tied up. See, I don't believe in coincidences. The word coincidence, it comes from the mathematical term to coincide. When two angles coincide, they are perfect for one another. So couldn't a coincidence be nothing less than two events lining up perfectly in your favor, no matter how messed up the situation? Maybe this is exactly where you need to be. What if every time we shook someone's hand, we didn't say nice to meet you, we said, finally. What if we treated every person like a dot on a map to every place in this world we ever needed to go? We'd have less questions, more realizations, less God wise and more thank you for the blessings. This is not an accident. You are not an accident. For example, I cannot leave my house without my five-year-old niece giving me the secret handshake. If you've never saw it, it looks like this. Spirit fingers blow it up, let it rain. That's the same handshake I learned from this guy at my dad's friend's house that wasn't related to anybody. And to this day, his laugh reminds me of the squeak on my bike I got for free from my uncle who said he couldn't ride anymore because his knees, they feel like jello. And I hate jello because my aunt, she once told me jello was made from horse bones. Coincidentally, the first horse I ever rode was named Bones. And he had this green saddle. The same exact green of this guy's eyes met at Starbucks the other day. And the green in his eyes reminded me of these emeralds I saw in this girl's loud earrings I met in Philadelphia on a bumpy plane ride back to Cali and the wrinkles. You know, the wrinkles in her hands. Thank you. All right, let's snap it up. <laughs> I like snap it up for your own poem. Yeah. I got, you gotta, if you don't like your stuff, you yeah. know, who, who can? What do you mean? <laughs> if I don't like it, then, you know, I got I to gotta at least like the stuff. So I could snap for my own poems. You like your own poems? Yeah, I like my own poems. You like your own poems? I do. Yeah. So. <laughs> do you ever feel it when you're writing like, oh, yeah. Right, you should feel that. I tell my students, like, you have to, like, like if you're not, like, busting up when you wrote it, like, then it's you know, probably no one's going to bust up if you're writing a funny mm. poem, you know? If you're not crying when you wrote it, then why should anybody expect to cry when they listen to it? I don't know. This logically makes sense to me. It's got to be true to you first. Right. I dig that. Yes. This poem's epic. I mean, I've listened to this poem. I have your album. I've listened cool. to it probably, like, 50 times. Cool. Glad. So uh, that means a lot. Thank you. What, what what was the process? It feels like when you maybe when you were writing it, you knew okay, this is gonna be a this is gonna be one of those poems. I don't know. If that's the, that was a feeling, or that's ever the feeling. But it's it was more like I wanted to have a full circle kind of feeling. And somebody told me about that um, red string myth, um, yeah. legend or Chinese myth, and uh, and it kind of resonated. And then uh, oddly enough, I saw this picture of this like guy in this operating room that was like connected by these red strings to everybody like that was in the operating room wow. and like and it was like a, a visual and it was I don't know, it just made sense to me that uh that we don't meet people by accident and this there are no accidents i mean even the people that hurt me or that i hate are still people that taught me you know so what do you mean yeah. you know people that don't uh, aren't happy thoughts in my, ma- in my mind you know like a bullies or ex-girlfriends or any of these things they're like they still you know taught you something there's no they weren't wasted you know so unless you chose to waste them but i, I think that there's no accidents or no coincidence i be- really believe in the poem and that there are no coincidences how'd you get to that philosophy because that's a deep one to think even hard things or even hurtful things in life right, is right. a worthwhile lesson where'd you how'd you get there yeah and that could mean i have something to do um, with my faith and um, and scripture saying you know God works all things together for good and that's one of those uh, I think when I see the word all in the in the Bible I I take it as all you know mm-hmm. like um, 
like if all things are being strung together for good right now, then then all things were designed. Um, and do we get to see the outcome of all these things? No, are there people dying right now, and we don't get to see why? And all, you know, so there's uh, those questions. But as far as like people, even the more I pay attention to why people are in my life, I start real. If I that kind of thinking makes me more intentional with my relationships, and mm. whether it's true or not, it helps me to see a uh, purpose and. In, in relationships and why I met you, for example, or, you know, why I'm, 10 years later we're sitting in your house doing, you know, there's, yeah. there's a purpose, a part of your presence was inspiration to me doing something and maybe who knows, is is somebody's writing poems all over the world because of what you're doing and they didn't meet you by accident or watch your podcast by accident. So it's a continuous like chain of us working together, you know, like the most beautiful, I think, metaphor in the whole Bible is like that we're a body, you know, we're God's body. So if you think, like, some of us are fingers, hands, ears, um, that we're strung together by this this fiber, this that we are a representative of a larger, uh, one larger purpose, one larger body. I don't know. It's gone forever. <laughs> About what? <laughs> About how we're all connected, you know. It just feels, that's, it feels that way. So. As you can see, I have an amazing guest. She goes by the name of Lady K! What's up? What's up? <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> would you mind sharing your second poem with us? I would, yes. What's this one called? Okay, so this one is called Slavery Hidden in Statistics. Um, it's about uh, the slavery that's kind of hidden um, within mass incarceration, number one, uh, the school-to-prison school pipeline. Um, it talks about uh, family and it talks about my mother um, trying to to mitigate the effects of mass incarceration for my family. Um, my father went went away when I was nine years old because he had received bad legal counsel um, and because he was also black. So that kind of like played into it, and also because he was Muslim. So there's a lot of just like factors that kind of played into my father. But he went away with life with no parole. Um, and so, you know, that's it's, it was really difficult for my family. And it also talks about like how uh, absentee fathers and how when a father is absent, what does that look like or how does that affect uh, children of color, specifically black ch- children? Um, so I kind of like talked about that and how my mom was strong enough to raise us above that and to and to, to nurture us past those kind of statistics that affect um, other uh, black children because they don't have that kind of like role model, like uh, that male role model in their lives or because, you know, something happens because of uh, those issues like mass incarceration. So Sounds like powerful. Let's yeah. do it. All right, cool. My mother is a warrior us. God blessed me with her presence. Her very essence kept me and my siblings from being a statistic. Single mother of five, four fathers did drive-bys in our lives. Mine sent to prison for the rest of his life for a woman shacking up with some other guy. I was nine when my father chose slavery. Nine children, six sons and three girls left behind. A sign and split amongst four women forced to play both mother and father because of his decision. My father made me a statistic. My little sister's father made her a statistic. See, Black girls growing up without patriarchs mark, marks black girls easy targets for sharks because all they want is love in that deep, dark sea. All they want is to call someone daddy, but the daddy they swap tongues and touches with are thieves stealing gems and purities and pimps selling black girls into another type of slavery. Like fathers, like daughters, the cycle of footstep never ends, but my mother kept my mind and my body from being bought to the highest bidder. She protected my little sister from her father, sewing and stitching himself in and out of her state of mind. I call him the Pied Piper, worse than my father in chains because this one likes to pipe pain, pipe cocaine into her system to make her addicted to see him. Just think about him and the drug of fatherhood he offers. And if my mother let her, my little sister would follow her father, the Pied Piper. But my mother, my mother took a sniper to his behind. Shot and pipe poison up his veins to make it real clear not to come back again. My mother is a warrior S. Commander-in-chief shaping three sons not into soldiers, but into generals and leaders. 
My mother kept my brothers from being a statistic. See, black boys growing up without patriarchs marks black boys easy targets for sirens and sharks because all they want is a father to look up to. All they want is to walk in their shoes, but the boots of their fathers are made of deceit, dishonor, and lack of loyalty to responsibilities and families. Another type of slavery in which the slave master and his system profits. Like fathers, like sons. My mother kept my brothers from selling their own souls to the highest bidder. She gave them a purpose to profit and to prosperity. She groomed them with religion to establish clarity and sincerity. My mother made her children rise above the slavery hidden in statistics without forgetting where we come from. From slaves to sharecroppers to suburbia, I don't forget where I come from and all those who hung for my freedom. I don't forget the different slavery still out there, waiting for black boys and black girls to choose nooses and chains. My mother was a warrior S. Because of her, we beat the statistics. Because of her, we won our freedom. I feel like it deserves way more than one hand. <laughs> <laughs> That's powerful. Thank you. Your mom's badass. Yeah. Yes, yeah, she is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she is. If you're watching this mom, which I know you will be, you know, tribute, you know. You're amazing. Yeah. And not just to her, but other, you know, single black mothers. Like, growing up in my community, um, it was really interesting. Um, just growing up just, you know, while being black, um, you see a lot of other children who don't really have fathers. Mm -hmm. Um, who or just weren't there for them. So, you know, it's kind of like for me, it was a tribute to all single black mothers or just single mothers in general because it's really hard raising, you know, well, my mom, five children by herself, but just raising any child by, alone by yourself is, you know, without a village, mm -hmm. um, it's, it, it, it's really hard, you know, and they have to put up their own lives just to raise and, you know, uh, raise their children to be good citizens and, you know, make sure that they're instilled with the values. So um, my mom put a lot off for us um and now she's reclaiming her time because hey. <laughs> a lot of us are you know kind of like out the door there's only like two little ones now um and it's just like been amazing seeing her flourish so, yeah what's the paradise that's found at the feet of your mother yes paradise is you know like in a smile we believe that you know you you can't go to there's no way you have entrance to paradise if your mom is not taking care of it <laughs> she is your number one you know, main gateway to, to, to paradise, like in a storm. Yeah. Greetings. It's Tom Merle here again. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of this poetry compilation with these brilliant artists who've shared their truth and their expression with us. I want to share two invitations. The first invitation is for you to join us this Sunday for this month's live and online expression session it takes place at noon Pacific Standard Time, 2 p.m. if you're in Central Time, 3 p.m. if you're on the East Coast, 8 p.m. if you're in London, 8 p.m. if you're in Nigeria. And you can join by phone or by video any way you'd like. You can join from anywhere in the world. Whether or not you're creative, if you've never written in your life, don't worry. We will make this super easy for you to express yourself and be with creatives from all over the world. The second invitation I'd like to share is an invite to join the Celebration Academy as an Inner Power Business Coaching member. Inner Power is an immersion program where each session you get the opportunity to ask any questions that you have. We go through empowering workshops and you're provided with a diverse community of entrepreneurs, side hustlers, and creatives such as yourself. I'd love to invite you to join our community and become an Inner Power member. You can learn more and sign up at tommerl.me slash innerpower. In case you don't know already, we do have a pay what you can scholarship program for Inner Power, which means whether you want to pay a dollar or $300, whatever you can pay, we would be grateful for you to be a part of our community. So I would love to see you as a member. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me, Tom at TomMerle.com. Otherwise, all of the information, once again, TomMerle.me slash Inner Power. I want to thank you once again for listening to this week's episode. I am truly grateful to have you as part of my community, and I look forward to seeing you next week. As always, I'm wishing you peace and blessings. Thank you. Oh.
oh, one, one more thing. I'd love to continue the conversation. Feel free to join me at tomroll.com slash join. Subscribe below or let's connect on social media. Tom Earl Artist. Thanks again for watching. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.